Welcome to Do Theology, where we keep doctrine in its place. I'm Jeremy in Utah. And I am Ken in Indiana. Ken with a, a silent N. There are two N's. The second one's silent, right? Now you just elongate. Ken. <laughs> yes, it's one syllable, but it's a dragged syllable. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that it looks like I have a green screen behind me because it's so amazing looking. <laughs> But it's actually my office just rearranged. So I'm in process of doing that. You can see I got some boxes and stuff still figuring those things out. Um, it's summertime. We're changing things up, moving things around. You and I were just in Lincoln, Nebraska together. Now we're back in our in our places uh, in Indiana and Utah. And mm -hmm. we're just, we're having a good summer, aren't we, Ken? Yeah, I am. Good. Are your kids feeling better? No. So they're they're having so a little they're bit less. They're not having a good summer. Slightly less good summer. It's it's the price you pay for having a good summer is what happens. Yeah. Because yeah, then you well, go true. you go have a good a good time someplace and then you come back and you're sick. So that's what the kids yeah. are dealing with right now, and we're trying to do everything we can as parents to avoid contracting. It's just a summer cold, confirmed non-COVID. So we're not worried about that. But yeah, it's good stuff. That's very important yep. to all of our listeners is, yes. you know, COVID tracking. Yeah. And I say good stuff and I mean bad stuff because this is not yeah, fun. Right. <laughs> not fun. No, no. Everything yeah, else, though. Everything else is great. Our household. Um, we, we were dealing with a sickness not that long ago, but now that's done. Um, hopefully for a long time. And, uh, yeah, we've got five kids now. I announced that a few episodes back that we did have a couple of children placed with us and you know by the end of the year hopefully they will it'll all be finalized and they will be uh, our children officially in the t eyes of the state so um, we have gone from three children to five in recent weeks and we're just adjusting you know I, I'm an only child and so I grew up in a very quiet home and uh, having five kids is a new, it's all new territory for me, but the Lord's been very kind and he's teaching all of us constantly. So that's going, that's going as well as it could go, I think. Cool. It's really exciting. And your church plant, how would you give an update on that? Because you guys have started meeting on Sunday mornings. Was that before the last season of Do Theology ended? No, I think I think we talked about that a little bit towards the end of the last season. Um, we had what well, our last episode went through. I think the month of May. So, um, yeah, I think people at least heard that. If if you didn't, hey, we are, our church plan is meeting on Sunday mornings. So that's really cool. We started that first week of May, and that's been going really well. God's been very good to us through that. He's uh, brought some new people along to us, and uh, some people that. Yeah, just different walks of life and things, so that's been really exciting, getting to know some people and uh, just getting to find out where they're at spiritually and getting them plugged in and things, so that's that's been really exciting. Uh, we're kind of in these these summer months, which I'm sure is, you know, it's it, summer months with church life is always kind of up and down, so we're kind of in the throes of that right now with some people traveling and uh, different summer events going on, taking people in different directions, but yeah, God's been really good. It's been exciting, and we we continue to get out and proclaim the gospel where we can. And yeah, we look forward to see what happens from there. Yep, summer months with churches—you just never know what you're going to get Sunday to Sunday. Uh, that's yeah, we're, we're feeling that here too. I mean, I was just gone for 13 days. I only missed one Sunday, but yeah, I was gone for a lot of stuff. And that's summertime's the time for that. So. Uh, church is going well here. Um, lots of good things happening. So, yeah, our ministries are what are most important, our local ministries that God has entrusted to us. And, you know, you know we're happy to say that those things are going well. God's being very kind and showing his faithfulness and everything else and all of that. So, Amen. Um, I do want to mention this to you listeners. We have over on our Facebook page happening right now a tournament of hymns 
we have created another tournament. It's not March Madness, obviously, because this is July, but it is a true 64 team competition tournament, just like March Madness. And we picked 64 hymns. They've been seated, they're pitted up against each other. And you can go to the Do Theology Facebook page at facebook.com slash do theology. And you can vote. Uh, you'll see how to do that. You click on these images and you can either like it for one hymn or love it for the hymn that it's against and to help advance these hymns to the end. And we'll see what we think collectively is the best hymn of all time, or at least the best hymn out of the 64 that we've provided. Um, you know, of course, there are hymns that we've forgotten, hymns that got left off for whatever reason. I had someone already ask, why isn't Rock of Ages on there? I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I just said, rock of ages got upset in the play-in game you know they were there <laughs> to do the play-in game to get into the tournament and they lost i you know it's just how that happened yeah that's the way it is but there's just too many songs right man <laughs> there's so many there's so just, many. yeah um it's, it's amazing how you can look over those hymns you can just go down the list and you can just start humming the the song because you know a lot of these you know by heart it's like wow that's amazing the human mind is amazing so yeah anyway Go check that out on our Facebook page. And we had a tournament back in March for March Madness. It was Christian podcast and YouTube ministries up against each other. And the winner of that was the Just Thinking podcast with Virgil Walker and Daryl Harrison. They are our guests today. We recorded this interview a little bit ago, um, but we're pleased to release it, to share it with you today. And in this interview, I believe it's Daryl. He mentions that they have an episode coming out about women preachers and they're, they're going to have a full expose on that. And I believe that's releasing on their channel today, the same day that mm. this podcast is coming out. So you can jump on over to the just thinking podcast and look at that episode that they referenced. But we talked with them about critical race theory and some other church issues. I'm sure you'll We'll enjoy the conversation. These are great guys, Virgil Walker and Daryl Harrison. Anything else to say about the tournament or that interview, Ken? I don't think so. As far as the tournament goes, make sure you know you. If you got a particular hymn that you really want to see advance, you got to share. Hit that share button to get more people engaged. But make sure people understand it's only the likes and the loves on the original posts that are actually going to get counted in the final tally. So, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Tell them to click on the picture before they vote. That's, right. that's the key. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what people think of songs. Uh, Ken and I with our wives have actually filled out prediction brackets because we're really weird, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if we're accurate in our estimation of what you guys will yeah. say. That'll be and, fun. And I think all four of us predicted a different winner. Yeah. We did. Yep. Melissa and I had totally different final fours even. So interesting stuff, yep. but enough about that. Let's get into the interview that we had with the Just Thinking podcast on the other side of the music. Neither Bethel nor Hillsong meet the biblical definition of a true church. Did you know that Jesus was born again? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. It's not just a black and white issue. There's an issue, there's a question of moderation and how damaging and how harmful things are. Not every act of divine revelation is equal in authority. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard to even respond to that, isn't it? It's, it's mind-numbing, it's blasphemous. When the apostles use the word atonement, they do not depict an angry God. It's cryptic. It's watered down. It has nothing to do with the judicial aspect of the Christian gospel. The most important of all doctrines is that the Bible is the word of God. They have different ideas than you do. You don't have to automatically kick them out of the kingdom. Our guests today are the hosts of the Just Thinking Podcast, one of the top-ranked Christian podcasts in America with well over a million downloads and the winner of our very own Do Theology Facebook podcast tournament. Daryl Harrison serves as the Dean of Social Media for Grace to You, the Bible teaching ministry of John MacArthur, and is a cultural apologist with a particular passion for helping Christians biblically navigate matters related to social justice and racial reconciliation. The other half of the show is Virgil Walker, the Executive Director of Operations 
Organizations at G3 Ministries, which is the organization that developed out of the G3 conferences and whose purpose is to educate, encourage, and equip local churches with sound biblical theology for the glory of God. Daryl and Virgil, welcome to the podcast and congratulations on winning our podcast tournament. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot, Kent. That was a big deal, though. That tournament was a big deal to us. Man. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for everyone who voted for us, man. That was a huge deal, bro. Well, your, your crew showed up, and I have this queued up for us. <laughs> Congratulations, you guys. Woo. Way hey, to go. Man. That's all right, Jeremy. Thanks for that, man. People, and I hope you appreciated the, the video I made of you all doing the Super Bowl yeah. shuffle with, with my oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> with that my was great hilarious. video editing skills. That was that was crazy, hilarious, man. Man, we were up against some stiff competition Ooh. in that tournament. I mean, it was no joke. That thing was yeah. no joke. Well, Seriously, bro. You you have passionate fans, and I think that speaks well to to your ministry. So yeah. that's yeah. pretty cool. It was, I, I just want to say, man, it was great for you guys to, to put that together. I mean, those are all um, podcasts that, that we've listened to, that I know I've listened to, and, um, you know, the guys who I respect and have grown and learned from uh, over the years. And so for us to, to, to have our, our, our toe in the water, so to speak, and uh, be up against uh, the, the, the likes of uh, Dr. James White and, and others was just phenomenal. So, uh, man, incredibly excited to to have been a part of it. And kudos to you guys for putting something like that together and then doing it in, in the efficient way that you did it. I thought it was really smart. Yeah, I was going to say that too, V. They, they did that really well. It was really well done, man. Well organized. Um, it was done with honor and integrity, man. And uh, it, it was really well done, guys. So congrats to you guys. Wow. Too. What, our yeah. heads are so big. I won't be able to walk out of my office. I won't fit through the door. You just puffed me up. Man. <laughs> really, I'm seriously, bro. It was really well done. Man. We usually make the joke that the people who win our contests, what do they win? Well, they win a unique opportunity to fight pride. And now you're giving that right back to us here now. Let's, I don't know what to say about this. <laughs> But we, that wasn't entirely our, an original idea. We, you know, we, others have done something similar. So it was just, it was just fun for us to, to participate mm. in that as well. Uh, but Virgil, we want to just jump in and want to hear a little bit about the things that you got going on. Uh, yeah. You recently moved down to the Atlanta area to be taking that position as the executive director there at uh, G3 Ministries. Just tell us a little about, about G3 and yeah. what the future holds for G3 as it kind of expands and grows beyond the conference ministry. Yeah, it's it's been amazing. Uh, I started, I uh, came on staff in, in December. Uh, G3, just for those who may be unfamiliar, uh, it stands for Gospel, Grace, and Glory. It is the conference-based ministry that was uh, the, the brainchild, the brain trust, so to speak, of Dr. Josh Bice. Uh, he is the uh, founder and president of G3 Ministries. He's also and friend the of the show. And friend of the show yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> pastor of Praise Mill Baptist Church. And so, uh, man, j just love, love uh, Josh and all of what he's done to take a 10-year-old, a coming up on 10-year, 10 10-year-old, a conference based ministry that was really founded on the basis of developing rich theology uh, here at a church uh, where he wanted to bring in speakers that would that would help amplify um, just what what it means to understand doctrine and theology in a local church setting uh, and and you know through the providence of God it exploded into what uh, it has become and so uh, it's been amazing to witness to watch I I uh, was familiar with G3 uh, probably in about 2015, 2016, and then actually came to my first conference in 2017 uh, when they moved it off of the uh, Praise Mill campus and onto uh, the uh, the space that uh, that they they were in at uh, the uh, GICC uh, so here here in Georgia, right at the right at the airport. Uh, this year we're going to be at the uh, Georgia World Congress Center and uh, Conference Center. It's going to be amazing. We anticipate. Uh, probably what it'll probably be be one of the largest reformed kind of sound biblically reformed non woke uh, mm -hmm. events of the year, uh, uh, and so we anticipate we'll be some, there. Yeah, we yeah, good deal. <laughs> anticipate someone in the neighborhood of about six thousand plus people that will be at the good. conference this year, and that'll be an absolute record. We have have exhibitors from every walk uh, that that you can imagine, and all of them are are folks that I'm walking through to just to make sure we dot the i's and cross the t's on what they believe theologically and, and the like. Um, my role as 
uh, director, uh, executive director of operations is to provide complete oversight. This year, I'm, I'm really uh, by, on the hip pocket, so to speak, of Dr. Bice as I'm learning every aspect, every facet of how the, how the, the conference-based ministry unfolds. And he and I together uh, are, are making plans for the, the ministry-based aspect where we're going to launch uh, a ministry from, uh, from curriculum uh, to educational pieces uh, and the like. And so a lot of great partnerships we're working on behind the scenes to, to get that moving and, and launched. But right now we're in the throes of just the G3 conference component and uh, it is ramping up quickly. I've just landed here, as you mentioned earlier, uh, here in uh, Douglasville, which is 40, 35, 40 minutes west of Atlanta. This is my my brother Daryl's stomping ground. So he's getting me up to speed about what's going on in these parts. Um, but but I'm just just excited to be a part of it. Uh, blown away by the fact that I that I am indeed a part of something uh, that that I've watched from uh, from afar uh, there in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so to be a, to be a part of what what's happening here with G3 is, is absolutely amazing. Really excited about it. Now, Daryl, is there a is there any jealousy in your heart there on the part of Virgil for being back there in your hometown? You know, there's a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> there's a smidge, man. I can't even lie, bro. I can't even hate, man. I can. I, I'm so envious of this brother, man, because number one, I love this brother to death. I love Virgil Walker to death, man. We've I've only known the guy for over three years during the duration that we've been doing the podcast. But I've come to love this guy as a brother, man. So it's kind of like the saying goes, when he shines, I shine. Hmm. So uh, I, I kind of look at it like that. The, the the role that he's in now with G3, man, is just such a tight fit with how, first of all, how God has innately wired this guy with the gifts and talents that he has. And then number one, he's just got the skill set for it. Hmm. He's absolutely got the skill set for it. So I just think it's kind of cool, man, how... Uh, in, in, in many ways, similar to how God came and interrupted my life two years ago mm-hmm, mm-hmm. by taking me from a, a small, um, you know, Reformed Baptist Church in Atlanta. You know, I had a managerial job with the DMV. Then here comes Phil Johnson. Boom. Hey, we want you to come out to mm-hmm. California and work for us at Grace to You. Uh, God came and interrupt, interrupted Virgil's life a lot in the same way. Um, you know, uh, you, you look at... Uh, how God just without, almost without notice, <laughs> without warning, without a heads up, says, you know, hey, I want you to, I, I, I want you in Atlanta. And he says, Daryl, I want you in LA. Uh, you know, and there's there's moments in your life, I, I kind of call them, I call them mile posts. It's like when you're driving down the freeway, and you see these green, you pass these green mile markers every mile. I, I look at anyone who's been a a Christian for any uh, amount of time that you should be able to look back on your life and see these mileposts where God was doing this or God wasn't doing that or God was sanctifying me here or God was doing this in my life. You should be able to, there should be definitive, notable uh, points in your Christian life where you can point. Now, they're not going to be as big as what God has done with being me and Virgil, but that's not the point. The, 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 the point isn't how uh, how big or how noticeable, how obvious, or how conspicuous it is. Uh, it's, it's just how genuine, how real it is in your life. You should be able to look back in your life and say, yeah, at this point in my life, I have evidence that God was doing this or that in my life. So I'm proud of this brother. I love him. Um, love him to death, man. He, 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 he's held up. He's, he's been a great witness for the Lord and for the church. And uh, I'm really proud of him. Hmm. Now, now speaking of your pilgrimage to the People's Republic of California, where you're now <laughs> residing, uh, you are the dean of social media there. Yep. Does that does that mean you just hang out on Twitter all day? To, to tell us what that means. Man, that means that first of all, I have to. There's a little bit of backstory about that job. That title is not mine. Okay, so that was not my idea to call myself the dean of social media. <laughs> I want to get that out there right now. Okay, all right. <laughs> that was the, that title was the brainchild of one Phil Johnson. Okay. Phil Johnson, everyone knows, the executive director here at Grace to You. And I didn't come upon that title. I didn't become aware of that title until I actually got the official job offer letter hmm. in the email uh, from Grace to You, and I opened it up, opened the PDF up, and boom, there it was. Dean of social media, had the job responsibilities lined up. And they're like, Dean of social media, what in the world? But yeah, social media is a lot of, it's a great deal of what I do. I would probably say about 60% of what I do 
has to do with the, uh, the sphere of social media as it relates to the purpose and mission statement here at Grace to You. So we want to leverage social media as uh, effectively and as efficiently as possible to expand the reach of uh, John MacArthur's teaching and resources. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what I do, but there's some ancillary stuff that I do either for Grace to You or uh, even outside or, or off hours mm -hmm. for Grace to You. Virgil and I like to say, even when we are at speaking events, we're, we're all, we're, we're respectively wearing both hats. We always wear both hats. So even if we're at a just thinking hat, we, we, we know that it's never just a just thinking um, event. It's always for him, just thinking slash G3. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's always just thinking slash GTY. Now, speaking of just thinking your podcast, it has exploded in popularity, especially if we went back to episode 108 and looked how that affected <laughs> your listenership. That episode was titled Critical Race Theory. Were you expecting that kind of reception from that episode? Um, how, how has that whole process been of this explosion in popularity? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here and start by saying, um, you know, even if you go before that, when I first met this brother, um, I, uh, my thought process was just to come alongside him to help to be the, the, the sidekick. Uh, and, 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 and I'm very much used to being uh, the, 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 top, the top dog, very much used to being the, the person in charge. Uh, but man, it was an absolute joy uh, to sit back and, and play kind of Robin to, to his Batman hmm. and, uh, and let him do his thing as, as he kind of got his, his chops around, uh, around you know live recording and the like. Daryl's much more of a writer. He's a beast of a writer. Uh, if you haven't read his material, you're absolutely missing out. Uh, it, it is from that writing uh, that that we launched uh, the the podcast. Daryl can speak more specifically with regard to that. I, I'll simply say, uh, we we never got into this with the anticipation. Hey, you know what? I've got a great idea. Let's get together and start a podcast to become one of the number one podcasts and uh, Christian podcasts in the country. That was never the goal. The goal was mm. simply. Let me get with this brother. I love what he's writing. He and I think very similarly uh, and, and love sound theology and love to chat it up with each other. And when we first connected, I was like talking to a brother uh, and like like literally my blood brother. I mean, we, we and, and if, if you follow the show, uh, you begin to know how much how many things uh, we actually have in common with each other, though we've lived separate lives. And so, uh, no, we never anticipated it from the, I think the first big pop for us was, uh, was the MLK 50 episode that we did uh, when we kind of got on people's radar screen for some of the things that we were saying as a result of what came out of that, that MLK uh, conference. And then, you know, we were doing what we did. Uh, people began to notice we'd gotten inv invitations to, uh, to different conferences, to the Truth Matters conference there at, at GTY with, with the folks at Grace, at, at, as well as, in fact, the first invite we actually received was from, uh, from the folks at G3, from, from Josh Bice at G3 to do a conference, to do their, their conference, to do a live uh, event there. And so we had begun kind of be, being picked up on the radar screen of uh, some in, incredibly important people who were very, very gracious to us, kind and platformed us. And uh, our goal was simply to be, uh, be truthful, uh, to give God the, the glory and honor due his name through what we did at, at Just Thinking and, and to examine everything through from, from a, you know, that we encountered in a cultural lens through a biblical worldview. That was the whole point of the process. And what God has done as a result of our fidelity to that has been mind blowing to, mm. I think both Daryl and I, I'll let him speak for himself. Well, I'll just interject real quick there. I remember you were talking about you were approaching it as kind of joining Daryl. And I remember when I first was listening to your episodes, I'd heard of Daryl just because I think by that time he'd been announced as Dean of social media and all that stuff at, at that point. And I was thinking, who's this Virgil guy? Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing on Twitter, I, I don't know how many followers you had then, but I'd never heard of you before. And then it's like, now um, everyone knows Omaha, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so, I mean, it is just, yeah, the Lord has, has taken it and has just grown it. It's been pretty fun to watch as an outsider. And the influence that you all have is obviously a, a good and helpful one uh, in our culture. And we're thankful for what the Lord has done. You, you know, Jeremy, let me just uh, append what uh, Virgil was saying. And it really something you just touched on as well. Let me just add to that a little bit. What's interesting when you talk about how the Just Thinking podcast has 
uh, the level of influence that it does, uh, that's that's a blessing and a curse. And what I mean by that, we're we're we consider it a blessing, right? We do. We we think it's a, a, a an amazing blessing, especially as Virgil said. We we never went into this. Matter of fact, when when I was first approached about the idea of doing the podcast, I turned it down. Hmm. I said no. I told Dwayne Atkinson, uh, our, our executive producer, I told him no. Friend of the show. Yep. Good. <laughs> not interested. Not interested. I said, uh, you know, my thing is writing. My thing is not being behind a microphone. But when you look at it, especially with what Virgil said earlier, when we did launch the podcast, it was never, ever with the goal of bringing attention to ourselves. It was never about influence. It was never about uh, footprint. It was never about any of that. Uh, but we're blessed to have the footprint, the the influence, the level of engagement that the podcast has. We appreciate God's grace and mercy in that regard. But it's a curse in that, uh, and we've heard this from countless people who have told us in person, uh, to a great degree, that influence is the result that 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 the Just Thinking podcast is unique in speaking to the issues biblically that we speak to. And that should not be the case. We should not be unique in that regard because the same scriptures that speak to us, the same scriptures we use, are, is, is available to every other believer, mm. every other professing, uh, every, every other podcast, every platform out there that uh, professes to be hosted by believers, that same scripture is available to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we get told repeatedly, I mean, time after time after time after time, you guys are dealing with topics that nobody else is dealing with through the objective lens of scripture. Mm -hmm. And you talk about some of our episodes that have really popped. Uh, what's weird is that most of the episodes that have really uh, resonated most with people are episodes we didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Or at least I didn't want to do. <laughs> I don't want to do the MLK 50 episode. Virgil mm -hmm. and I, Virgil, you 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 bear me out here, bro. During while the conference was going on, we had already said we're not touching this. We're not touching this. I streamed the I live streamed the entire co conference. I I saw what was being said. I heard what was being said. I saw who was saying what was being said. Virgil and I said, nope, we're not touching it. Same thing with the George Flint episode. I didn't want anything to do with that episode. I was like, nope. I'm not doing it. Virgil was trying to urge me to do it. I said, nope, we are, we've already covered that ground. Hmm. The critical race theory episode was not so much an episode that I didn't want to do, but we knew going into that episode that critical race theory was so multi-layered, it's so multifaceted that we knew that if we dealt with that episode, it was going to be one of our lengthier episodes in terms of time. But what's awesome about the critical race theory episode is that although it's three and a half hours, that episode has been downloaded more than 70,000 times. Okay. A three and a half hour podcast episode downloaded three and a half, uh, uh, sorry, 70,000 70, times plus. So we thank God for the influence that we're having. We thank, we thank God that people are being edified by the content that they're hearing, but we don't like hearing that we're so unique within the church. That should not, mm. that our voices are so new, unique within the church within the body. That should not be the case. Mm. Yeah. Now, you guys came on on my radar just a little bit before that CRT episode released. Uh, I don't remember exactly what brought me in, but just a little bit before that. Uh, and so as that re episode was released and I began listening to that, one of the things that I found very helpful about that episode as you work through all the ins and outs of CRT and all the, all the ideas at play, but one of the things that you did was you went straight to the horse's mouth on who was teaching these ideas and, and where yep. these ideas were coming from. Why was yep. it so important for you to approach things in that way and not just listen to other people who are critiquing it, but to go straight to the source on those things? Yeah. You know, your question, Ken, reminds me of a, uh, uh, a tweet that Tim Keller said a couple of weeks before. <laughs> He's we been recording. known for that lately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lately. <laughs> Tim, Tim Keller sent a tweet, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the tweet handy right now. I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He sent a tweet uh, that just happened to be a couple weeks before we were scheduled to record the Critical Race Theory episode, where he said something along the lines of, it was targeted at, his comments was targeted at uh, people who he deemed to be uh, anti-CRT. And he, he criticized them because they always tend to 
uh, promote and, and, and cite uh, uh, sources that are anti-CRT in their argument. So I quote tweeted him and I said, don't worry, Tim. I said, in the episode of CRT that we're going to record in a couple of weeks, we're going to sort pro-CRT sources to make our case against CRT. We did the exact same thing in the whiteness episode. We, we quoted, we went straight to liberation theology, pro-liberation theology sources to make our argument against, uh, or, for, or against white, against the idea of whiteness. So we use the idea of blackness to argue against the idea of whiteness, but this is what we do. So I thought it was important for us, but this is what we do, guys. This is what we do, Jeremy. This is what we do, Ken. The CRT episode was no different than our normal method of operation. We put hours, bro, into these episodes. We study, we read all the time. But I thought it was important, especially for the CRT episode, because that narrative that Tim Keller was pushing is a common narrative that pro-CRT, uh, or what they call themselves, Chris, uh, uh, push and promote and propagate that those who are against CRT don't read the CRT scholars. They don't read the CRT sources. They don't read the academics and the PhDs. Well. If you listen to this episode, our motive was not to prove anything to them, but when you when you study critical race theory, everything out there is written by academicians for academicians. So you by default are reading uh, men and women who have PhDs primarily in sociology or education or psychology. There are no orthodox biblical sources out there. None. I mean, zero. Okay. So somebody asked me, well, what books would you recommend uh, for a believer to learn about CRT? I'm like, well, first of all, there aren't any biblical books out there. There aren't any biblical sources out there. Every book you find is going to be advancing the idea of CRT. But this is what we do, Ken. We, we, I think for that episode uh, combined, Virgil and I probably had about 130 footnotes for that one episode. Uh, and it could have been longer than three and a half hours, to be honest with you. We left a lot on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. we, actually, we, ac we actually talked about, we actually talked about the idea of doing multiple episodes with the CRT episode. Um, Daryl was against that. He, I mean, primarily because we, we, we want our listeners to have a, have a one-stop volume deal. Like if, if you heard the first one, we don't want you to have to wait, you know, two, three mm -hmm. weeks or a month to get the second one. And then you have to wait to get the next yeah. one. Yeah. So we just, we just put it all together. I, I just want to say one thing to add to what Daryl uh, just said there, our, our, our critics, which again, we, 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 we have uh, we have kind of, kind of a three word, word response to most critics our, our, our three word response to most critics are, I don't care. Um, but, but the critics who have the tendency to say, you know, you guys have not addressed it. it it's really, it's really a, it's, it's a straw man argument. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's really a straw man. It's, you know, you haven't done the homework. That's what they like to say. <laughs> you haven't, you haven't read the original sources is what they like to say as if we're afraid of original source material. Uh, as if we're afraid of of reading Cone's works, which you know, I, I've got a I've got the library of Cone's works. I mean, Daryl spent you know time at, at at Princeton walking through Conean works. So it, it's not no one's afraid of that material, and no one's afraid to read original sources. In fact, to the point that Daryl just made, more times than not, when you read original source material against the light of Scripture. Most of those academicians, uh, so-called systematic theologians, which is what Cohn was considered, uh, fall on their face. They, they, there's, there's, there's no, there's a system to what they're doing. There's no theology based upon yeah. what they're doing. And so, uh, I, I think it's to our advantage, actually, to more times than not, when we go out to speak uh, or share at an event, I'm sharing from what, what the, what the, what you know, what those thinkers actually said themselves. I'm sharing from their own writings, their own thoughts, their own words, for the purpose of exposing people to what they probably would not have otherwise, uh, so that they can see this is the, you know, doing the homework uh, and studying original source material is nothing to be afraid of. It's actually very helpful. 
in October of 2018, I did a four part message, uh, four part sermon series here at our church in Utah on so God's word on social justice is what it was called. And I did a ton of studying for that. I've got a huge folder here that I'm keeping that I hope becomes ancient history one day. <laughs> I hope that they're relics that aren't relevant one day, but, um, but did a lot of studying on that. And an amazing thing that God did through this guys, I did a, a message on race. And that Sunday, a black man came into our congregation. We're in Utah. Yeah. We never see black people. I get it. <laughs> we just, I get it. we never do. And there he was. Um, the next Sunday, it was about homosexuality. And the day before, a young man reached out to us on Facebook and said, I'm a homosexual and I'm planning on visiting your church tomorrow. And I said, this is what the sermon's about. <laughs> it was already planned. And, and he, he came. And then the next Sunday, it was about gender roles. And we had someone who just came out of a liberal church with a, with a woman pastor. Who was who came, and one of those three people stayed uh, and were thankful. And um, but I'm wondering, you know, as God did that in my life, uh, just in a very small way, you know, you guys are dealing with all those types of people in your audience and getting all sorts of feedback. I'm sure. Have you have you heard from your audience about anyone who's changed their mind? Have there been any? really positive, encouraging stories about people whose minds have been changed through this ministry? Yeah, we get uh, most of our feedback uh, we get through email. And then I look at the reviews that we get on iTunes, on Apple iTunes. We get some really cool reviews uh, mm. there. Um, you know, we've got a couple of folks on our team who really one of their responsibilities is managing and keeping track of the uh, email feedback that we get. But uh, I think what's interesting about your question, Jeremy, is, 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 is that it really kind of goes into one of the uh, aspects of the Just Thinking podcast that, that motivates Virgil and me to do what we do. Um, the format of the Just Thinking podcast is such that we don't have guests on our show. We never have guests on our show. Uh, we've been asked We've been urged, but we refuse to do that. That's not what this show is about. This show is not about debate. This is not a this is this is this is an apologetics mm -hmm. uh, platform, but it is not about debate. We're not trying to prove anything to anyone. Okay, um, we're John seventeen. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is true. We're going to give you the truth as God by His Holy Spirit gives us wisdom to do that. We're going to give you the truth of the word of God and let you deal with it in any way you choose. Okay. So we don't, we don't necessarily uh, strive to change anyone's mind, but we've gotten countless uh, testimonials either through the uh, a podcast review or the email, especially as it relates to this uh, social justice slash wokeism of uh, people who said that you're listening to you guys changed my mind. You gave me a different perspective, a different outlook on these issues. They'll say things like, well, I never knew, I never considered Act 1726 in the context of race and ethnicity. I never considered that before. I never considered, um, uh, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, through the lens of scripture. And you guys opened my eyes when you talked about the religious practices that sort of imbibe uh, the activities that they engage in uh, and things of that nature. Now we're, see, now we're proven right. You, you've been reading the stories that's been coming out re recently about the founders of BLM, uh, resigning, leaders resigning. Uh, mm -hmm. Listen, we're not basking in the glow of anything, uh, but that's just an example of how we just lay the truth out there and we let the Holy Spirit, you know, as he sovereignly will or won't, uh, let that truth resonate within the hearts of folks that listen to us. Um, Virgil and I often talk about how when we when we sit down to record an episode, it's kind of like you guys do. You hit record, you do your thing, you hit stop, you do post production, you drop the episode. We don't know who's going to listen. <laughs> we have no idea, but that's not our concern. Hmm. Our primary concern is to believers. That's our target audience. Our target yeah. audience is to the church. Yeah, I. I'm sorry, brother. You, you go ahead. Got, go ahead, Vic. You good? You good? I, I was, go ahead. I was, I was just going to jump in to say that you know, I think I think Daryl is, is is making the point that we often make. Uh, our job is to be obedient and to glorify God through what we do, and and he 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 takes care of of the results. 
uh, the results are, in, are indeed his. And so we, we, we really try to live that out um, in, in every way, shape and form. I'll tell you what we have seen a lot of, we haven't seen somebody who's, I, I haven't yet experienced someone who's been woke, who said I've not been woke, but I tell you what, what we are seeing a lot of, and we're seeing this time and time again, when we interact with people. And that is uh, folks who stop us in tears saying, yeah, I, I thought I was all alone. Like mm. I, I, I looked at culture around me. I looked at church culture in particular and everybody that I knew had gone woke mm. and I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know how to articulate it. I didn't know how to, how scripture interacted with it. And so I thought I was on an Island by myself until I listened to you guys unpack the truths of scripture. And it helped me. I mean, time and time and time and time again, when we've been somewhere, someone has stopped us next to tears, expressing uh, th their thankfulness for what we did, and, and by just simply opening up the scripture and 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 evaluating what culture is is dictating. Hmm. Well, brothers, we have two more questions. Are you good on time? Yeah. Yeah, we're good, man. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. All right. Uh, so. Just, just so you guys know, the overall premise of our show, Do Theology, uh, we want to help the church do theology better. And one of the ways that uh, our role in the midst of that, uh, we just want to help people think through intentionally what is primary doctrine and what is secondary and, and what would be in a third column of conscience issues. And we want to discern those things biblically. By <clears throat> primary, we refer to things that transcend hermeneutics. They're definitional to Christianity, so think things like the resurrection, the deity of Christ, justification by faith— Secondary, we mean things that, you know, that Christians are going to disagree on these things, and that's those disagreements are based on hermeneutical or exegetical differences, but they don't make you a heretic, right, as long as you're not violating primary issues with right. that secondary position. So with that kind of framework in mind, I wonder how you guys would approach the concepts of critical race theory and where you might place them. We've got a chart where you might place them on the chart. And if there are any issues within critical theory that you would say violate primary doctrine. I'd be happy to jump. Yeah, I'd be happy to jump into that. I, I, I think uh, in, in, in its infancy, if, if I can say it that way, uh, in its infancy, in the, in the infancy of witnessing social justice take root within evangelicalism. Um, I, I'd say naivete played a, a large part in this. Um, I'd say secondary issue. Um, what I mean by that is folks were just wanting, in, in their mind, their thought process was, uh, I, just want, I just want things to be fair. You know, I just want things to be fair. Uh, I, I, I see something happening with, with someone of a particular culture or particular ethnicity, and it seems unfair. Now, they didn't have all the, all the information. They, didn't, they had not done any research. In their mind, this was this knee-jerk reaction based upon a cultural narrative that was kind of thrust upon them by media, social media, um, um, television, news, for, you know, formalized media. Their thought was, I want things to be fair. And so the thought was, you know, I, I, I want to be caring. I want to, I want to err on the side of of, of benevolence, of, of of being careful and caring, uh, and 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 I'd say secondary issue. Uh, we're not viewing scripture rightly. Uh, the, the, there's no scripture that tells you that everything is supposed to be fair. You know, the, 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 there's, there's not this, this scriptural idea about uh, some some ethnic parity going on that we should be striving towards. So, so secondary issue, not not heretical just yet. But what I but what we've witnessed, I'd argue, over the course of the last three years, two and a half, three years, is when you began to hear the language change from "Hey, fairness." Uh, to one of equity, to one of uh, of, of, of not only, not just social justice, uh, but where people are beginning to argue in favor of of ideologies that oppose Christianity, like critical race theory, uh, when they're beginning to step into the fray and and call things gospel issues. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about primary issue. Uh, now we're talking about things that mess with uh, and cloud and shade what the gospel actually is to the point where where Dal and I argue, and he can speak to this with, with clarity on it on, on his own on, in his own right, to, to where now what we have is a is a different religion. Now what we have is people are bowing the knee to a false religion 
that is that that, that is salvific that has its own esch uh, eschatology, uh, that has its unique harmardiology, that has, I mean, it, it, there's a total framework and shift now with what we're dealing with today uh, that, that I'd argue is a primary issue. Uh, again, we can, we, can, we can play around the edges with this, we can talk about it, but, but Dar I, I, I'd say three years ago, maybe, maybe two and a half years ago, Daryl and I were asked, beginning to ask the question, with regard to the folks who are who are holding these social justice positions, at what point do we call call these folks heretical? At what mm. point do we do we say they are outside of the bounds of orthodox Christianity? Uh, and, and again, you know, folks can argue which way that that turns, but but I think we have to we have to begin asking those mm. kinds of questions honestly. And again, I, that, that was kind of a, a rough stab at, at what you asked. Uh, and, and again, kind of half-hearted. I, I think initially, I'm, I'm always trying to be pastoral uh, and yep. give the benefit of the doubt uh, to those who are kind of coming into this from a standpoint of naivete and just caring and fairness uh, to those who know exactly what they're doing, who are advancing a cause. And, and I, I could name names and tell you who and why and what they said, uh, but that, that wasn't the nature of, of your question. But I, I simply think there, we're at a point at which we have to draw a line. I think Vody's book, Vody Baco's book, Fault Lines, really mm -hmm. establishes that there's, a, that there's a line of division. There's a line of demarcation there. Folks are on one side and folks are obviously on the other. Well, when a book like Woke Church comes out, uh, it shows that the priorities have shifted Absolutely. in our ecclesiology and yeah, it seems seems extremely dangerous. I think sure. what we're seeing here, Jeremy, you're absolutely right. It is extremely dangerous. I want to try to keep track of what Virgil says. There's a couple of points I want to make. Um, let's let's talk about woke church for a second, though. I, I think Eric Mason's book, Woke Church, it wasn't the tipping point, but it was one of the tipping points for me that sort of cancels out all the criticism and all the accusations, all the assertions we're seeing within certain elements of evangelicalism with regard to whiteness and white supremacy. Because what, what people like Mason, Ibram X. Kendi, and others are establishing just by their own words and by their own statements that they're making is that there's, a, there's an element of black supremacy out there that's just as energized yeah. by the color of their skin, by yeah. the culture that they grew up in, and by every single box that they say white supremacists check off, you can check off those same boxes with regard to uh, black supremacists. See, Mason is a black supremacist. Ibram X. Kendi is a black supremacist. They won't say it, but I'll say it. They are black supremacists. They are, their worldview is just as much shaped by their skin color, by the texture of their hair, by the environment, the cult, social culture environment that they grew up in as any person who they would accuse of being a white supremacist. And here's the danger of critical race theory graduating, if you will, from a secondary issue to a primary issue. When you consider what Ibram X. Kendi said at the church in New York a yeah. few, few weeks ago, yep. where he was interviewed and he literally said that he, he does not subscribe to savior theology. He subscribes mm -hmm. to liberation theology. Now, when you hear someone like that, Th that is, I don't know what more evidence you need of critical race theory being another total gospel when it offers you a totally different soteriology than the, go the gospel offers you. You have to identify Irma S. Kennedy as a heretic, mm -hmm. as a heretic. And anyone who, was so, who would associate himself, such as, Jamar, as Jamar Tisby has, in joining Irma S. Kennedy's organization there at Boston University, who would partner himself against scripture, right? What does light have in common with darkness, right? But you're gonna come alongside a brother who already explained to you from his own mouth that he doesn't subscribe to savior theology. You see, so it, it's not so much, you, you, can, you can have a primary issue veiled as a secondary issue. Hmm. If you don't know the language, Virgil and I, we, 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 we reiterated this in the critical race theory episode, and we've done it consistently after that episode came out. Um, rule number one for me, in uh, for any Christian who wants to be able to have a biblical defense against critical race theory, rule number one is you must learn the language of critical race theory. You must learn the language. See, critical race theory, Virgil just touched on this. What critical race theory does, it proffers... Um, 
a, a morality uh, that's rooted in humanism and moralism. Mm -hmm. So it says, well, it's, it's, it's liberation theology repackaged with a, uh, uh, with new language. And what I tell people all the time is that, listen, uh, feeding the hungry, that's nothing new. Uh, housing the, the, the homeless, that's nothing new. The Bible already teaches us how to uh, uh, deal with those who are materially poor. I like to say materially poor in contrast to spiritually poor. Mm -hmm. Spiritual poverty is worse than material poverty. Mm -hmm. But material, material, so critical race theory, that's one of the, the key pillars of critical race theory is just, is built upon this myth that there has to be societal equity. And then evangelical crits, evangelical critical race theory, they sort of fold in the gospel into that as if the gospel doesn't deal with that already. The gospel doesn't teach uh, social equality. The very idea is nonsensical because critical race theory says, well, everyone should have equal opportunities, but not only equal opportunities, but equal outcomes. Now, how do you give that to every person? How do you do that? So we have to become thinkers, bro. This is why I say to everyone, the Just Thinking Podcast is not for everybody. <laughs> the Just Thinking Podcast is an expositional, exegetical, apologetics podcast. We get on them, we get behind the mics, we expose the word of God. We don't look at the clock. Had a guy verge, I don't know if you saw this. Had a guy recently, speaking of uh review reviews on Apple iTunes, <laughs> had someone leave us a, re a review recently where he said our podcast was too long. Uh, he said, uh, I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get the review real quick. I want, it's and really what, What's that three word response you have? Yeah. <laughs> I had my mug. I wish I had my mug. He says, here it is. I'm looking, I'm, I'm, can you guys see that? See it too long? Yeah. Huh? He says, I think the content is great and the hosts obviously do their homework, but the episodes are too long. They need to be condensed and time could be saved with less cutting up. Now, with all due respect to this brother, I don't care. <laughs> See, here's the cool thing about a podcast: you can shorten it to within as many as many as, as brief a segment as you want. You control that. But see, we don't have time to be concerned about what people like this say. We appreciate them listening. I'm not discounting that, but that's not what we do. If we were married to the clock, it's like Virgil said. We started out like that, verse, didn't we? Yes, we, we did. started. We started out dropping weekly episodes because we were so concerned about the clock. But and and to where we are now, brothers, we just kind of morphed into that. That was, me and Virgil didn't have a meeting mm -hmm. somewhere and say, "Hey, man, we need to we need to start taking our time or something like that." But as we start dealing with these issues more expositionally, you by by default, your time. episodes are going to be longer. So we're not trying to entertain anyone. Mm -hmm. We're trying to equip believers to be able to argue biblically and intelligently against these ideologies and these worldviews that are coming against the church and against scripture. I, I'll, mm. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. And I know you've got another question to ask. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, when we get behind the microphones at the end of the day, um, it really is about one, the content that we're going to cover. Okay. We, we, we want to, we, we want to do that justice. We want to, we want to, we want to do right by what we've, what we've determined is the topic is the subject matter. We want to do our research. We want to do our homework. And, and, and I think that's evident with every episode at the same time. And Daryl, Daryl alluded to this at the top of, of our conversation. Now, I love this brother. And, and we have a great time when we interact with each other, uh, whether the microphone is on or off, whether we're in person or not, when we're with one another, we have a great time. So the banter and the cutting up, I think folks enjoy it because it's really authentic. And what you receive in that is you, you really are sitting down listening to two brothers who, who love one another, who, who, who enjoy each other, who have the same silly sense of humor, uh, who think some of the same things are funny. Uh, and, 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 and then, and then who love theology and are very serious about that as well. Uh, you get an opportunity to sit in and listen to that discourse. And so if, if that's too long for somebody, we, we, we may not, we not, we, we, we may not be your cup of tea. And I, I, I'm not mad at that, but we'll probably not change anything we're doing as a result. Hey, real quick guys. Um, women pastors, uh, just sort of dovetailing on what we were just talking about here. 
and what Virgil was just saying. I just emailed, just before we went on with you guys, I just emailed Virgil, I think 14 pages of notes that I've, that I've written up for our next episode. Our next episode is coming out middle of July. We're going to be dealing with that issue of women pastors. 14 pages of notes, guys. Now, that's just my side. I don't know. Virgil's going to take his time and, and, and do his thing on his end. Uh, but listen, and I'm not trying to boast here, but I, I would not, I, I would not be able to have a clear conscience. Paul talks about how his conscience is clear. My conscience has to be clear, bro. I have to do the work. Yeah. I have to do the work. I cannot cut corners with the Lord, with God's word. I cannot do it. I will not do it. I refuse to do it. Um, so with all due respect to listeners who think we're too long, you know, there are other podcasts out there that you might want to go out and, and try. There's some TED Talks that run 25 minutes, man. You know, What's that? There's some TED Talks that just yeah, run 25 run about minutes. 20. <laughs> So we're going to take this issue of women pastors in the same way we approach yeah. the critical race theory episode. I think I'm, I think I'm quoting like 18 Puritans in this uh, episode on hmm. women pastors. We, we we do the homework, bro, and I cannot, I will not. Uh, it says somewhere, and it's like the, the when Dave when when King David went to buy the field for the uh, to build the temple, uh, the field owner said David said no, I will not offer to God that which cost me nothing. I will not hmm. do it. I'm not, I refuse to cut corners, bro. We will not. We won't do it. Well, I can't wait until your episode on women wearing head coverings comes out so we can hear all about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians, Ooh. and I need someone to do that heavy lifting for me. <laughs> Jeremy trying to, hey, try to get us even more trouble, Virg. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the reality of it is any wayward movement, any cult, any false religion— you got to learn a new dictionary. You got to learn how they talk, how they're hiding their false doctrines. And it takes time. It just takes time. There's no way around it. And so anybody who's truly wanting to know about these issues isn't going to complain about the length of the podcast, understanding that, like you, you mentioned, these are primary issues disguised as secondary right. issues. Mm -hmm. So right. about, you got to take the time Jeremy, to about identify. About 30%, one third of every episode that we do is probably spent defining terms. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. It has to be done. You know, I'm out here in Mormon land. We're about an hour south of Salt Lake, uh, just south of Provo, where BYU is and everything else. And yeah, dealing with, with Mormons, you got to learn th the lingo. They right. use the same words, right. all different definitions. Yep. Hold so, the definition. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Well, uh, hey, as we wrap up, tell us about the Just Thinking scholarships. I believe these are relatively new. Uh, tell our listeners about this, uh, this opportunity that's been created through this ministry. Yeah, so the Just Thinking part, uh, I'm sorry, the Just Thinking scholarships are in partnership with the Masters University here in Southern California, where uh, John MacArthur is the chancellor there. Um, we were actually approached um, late last year with this idea. Actually, the university approached us with it. Our good friend, Dr. Mitch Hopewell, who is the provost at TMU, uh, approached us with this idea. He's a big fan of the the uh, the podcast and really loved the exposition and the uh, exegesis that we apply to these topics. So he thought about uh, uh, um, partnering with us on a very uh, significant um, investment, um, not just in terms of the uh, uh, monetary value. These are five $10,000 scholarships. So these are five $10,000 scholarships, $50,000 annual investment um, in Just Thinking Ministries. We recently, Virgin and I recently selected the first uh, winners of the uh, scholarship. So we've uh, communicated that to uh, Dr. Hopewell. Uh, but in addition to the scholarships, we also named 15 Just Thinking Fellowship winners. Uh, mm -hmm. So in addition to the five $10,000 scholarships, you also have 15 fellows who are gonna receive a $500 uh, scholarship um, as well. So. Uh, we're going to be partnering with the Master University under the um, uh, guidance and leadership of Dr. Hopewell going forward, not, not just with these scholarships, but Virgil and I will probably be uh, conducting uh, lectures and, and seminars uh, there on the TMU campus. All that right now is being worked through, um, but we, we, the partnership that we have right now that Just Thinking has with TMU goes well beyond the scholarships. This is long-term investment where we're going to be putting feet on the ground on the campus at uh, at TMU to help these students navigate biblically through these uh, cultural apologetic issues 
uh, that are going to continue to come against the church. And Jeremy, I wanted to say, bro, your thick folder that you have from your four-part social justice series, you might want to keep that thing dusted off, bro, mm. because the, from, from what we're seeing mm. on the landscape, you're going to have to pull that back yeah. out again, bro. Yeah. 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 I went all the way back to the Frankfurt school with that. We went deep on that sermon series. Yeah. So, you went uh, back to where we went with the critical race theory episode. Yeah. Then, bro. Yep. Right. Exactly. I, I would, I would just want to add, man, that how ex excited I am as well for, for the partnership. Daryl has spent quite a bit of time with boots on the ground there with, with uh, Dr. Hopewell and, and, uh, and with Masters University. Uh, one of the things that excites me about this in particular is not just the, the, mon the monetary gift, which is, it, which is incredible, uh, not just the opportunity for Daryl and I uh, to, to interact with students, but, but the long-term impact of developing just, uh, in, in, in my mind, an, an army of young people who are properly theologically equipped uh, to engage the issues of culture alongside the, the scholarship winners. We're talking about having our, our interns work alongside us uh, in some capacity with regard to research uh, and, do, and doing some investigative work on, on particular issues and subjects and topics that we might find uh, relevant to uh, what they're studying in school and to what we're doing with just thinking. And so a uh, lot of great things that, that, will, that will come uh, out of that. And again, with, with my connections here at, at, at G3 and the G3's connections, with with uh, Masters uh, Seminary uh, and with and with GTY, we're we're really excited about what the future has in store. So, cool. awesome. Well, Virgil and Daryl, we are so very grateful that you came on the show today. Uh, for our listeners, we encourage you if this is whetted your appetite a little bit. If you've not listened to the Just Thinking podcast, we encourage you to go check that out. There's so much great content there. And I know you will be encouraged and edified and uh, equipped through listening to that ministry. But we do thank you, Virgil and Daryl, for joining us today. Hey, thank you guys for having us. Man. Thanks, Thanks for having us, guys. A lot of fun.